So this is the first of the PowerPoints on Pliny's ghost stories. So this is the formulaic opening to the letter. So Gaius Plinius is writing to his friend Sura. Sura was a senator, a Roman senator, who was also consul three times, very close to uh, Trajan, the Emperor Trajan. So quite a successful and powerful man. And that's all you need to know, that he was a friend of Pliny's. OK, the opening of this letter is a nice short sentence. Leisure provides the opportunity. Here's the word for leisure and here's the word for provide. OK, this is the opportunity. And this is the bit that, that needs to be commented. Both and et et. And then we've got two datives for me and for you. And then we've got two uh, gerunds in the genitive of me learning and you teaching. So gerunds are verbal nouns, just as we have in English, like the teaching at my school is wonderful. And the learning of the pupils is superb. Those are both verbal nouns, they're gerunds in English. So we've got this really nice, elegantly balanced phrase here for me and for you. We're both going to get something out of this, um, these stories. And so therefore we ask ourselves, if we're talking about teaching and learning, is this just a letter? Is it more philosophy? Or are we just going to have a cracking good story? What is this all about? And you should be asking yourself this as we go through the rest of the account. Now, this language of philosophical inquiry, I think, is picked up in this next longer sentence, slightly more complicated, but the colouring of the phrases should show you how it works out. OK, therefore, because I want to learn something and for you to teach me something, therefore, I would like present subjunctive of volo to know. And then we, we have a word like utrum here, meaning whether whether you think. So this is the language of knowledge, isn't it? Knowing and thinking. Scire e putes. Whether you think um, ghosts, phantasmata, to be, and that they, this is an accusative infinitive, there's a one infinitive, essay, here's the second, and that they have their own propriam figurum, that they have their own shape, and aliquod, some numen, a really uh, important word in, Greek, in Roman religion, which is often untranslated, actually, when religion specialists use it. So here it's some supernatural power, the numen, OK? So whether they have their own shape, their own figure, whether they have uh, some supernatural power. So two things that they might have, and they are contrasted with two uh, other terms, or whether you think them to be inania et wana, uh, empty and of no substance. Uh, those are really kind of both saying perhaps the same things, aren't they? Um, and that we receive, we accept them as having an image, ex metu nostro, from our own fear. So this is the philosophical question that's being set up here. Do they have their own shape? Do they have supernatural power? Or are they just insubstantial shadows? And we give them form arising from our own fear. So we've got two phrases balancing here. We've got the that they ghosts exist. That's the first one, that they exist. And then that they have two properties, propriam figuram and que aliquod numen. That's the second property. And then balancing with that around the axis of the, the verb here, you think we have the negative properties inania et wana and the and there means or okay so we've got slightly more complex accusative infinitive sentence here it's about knowledge it's about understanding uh, but balancing around two concepts positive negative on either side then the story is introduced in a short little sentence by by all these verbs in the first person, singular in the present. But I, at any rate, I, emphatic positioning, am led, do core, passive, I'm led uh, 
to believe that they exist, especially, now this is, that whole orange section is really difficult to translate, but credam is this verb of believing, and imprimis is going to be here, especially, that they, are, and the, the exist is going to be the essay, that they, that they do exist, because of, of what I hear uh, happened, akidise, to Curtius Rufus. So here's the verb of hearing. So we've got belief, being led, hearing, these three verbs. That which happened uh, to Curtius Rufus. And I think it's unusual that the Curtius Rufus is there at the end and not the verb. Uh, but I think it's because that's leading us on to the next sentence, which is going to be all about Curtius Rufus. Now, Curtius Rufus was a historical figure. He did exist. Not quite sure. He's mentioned by Tacitus, and we think that he might have been a man who uh, we have, of whom we have the work, uh, History of Alexander the Great, Quintus Curtius Rufus. Certainly, he had some... Uh, great success in the first century AD, opening up the silver mines uh, in Spain, uh, earning a lot of money and therefore doing very well under the Emperor Claudius. And then he gets the uh, province of Africa uh, and he does die in Africa. So he, he does exist, he did exist, shall we say. Um, and therefore all three people so far, Pliny, Sura, Curtis Rufus, they are real people. This is a genuine inquiry about a genuine person, but it's also fictive, fictional, and it's also philosophical. Okay, so now we're into the story about Curtis Rufus. Um, still, to this point, Tenuis ac et obscurus. So those are the um, two adjectives. Tenuis, like, means thin, literally. So without any achievements and obscure. Yeah, unknown. He's he. This comes from a word that ultimately gives us words like adhere, meaning to stick to. So he'd been attached as. A comes as a companion, so we've got here as a member of the prov provincial governor's retinue, a comes, it's kind of a technical term, to the person who had obtained Africa, so to the man who had Africa as his province. In other words, it was some kind of uh, propraetor, proconsul command. Okay, we don't need to know his name, we just know that that's in the dative meaning he had obtained the person who had obtained Africa. Then we uh, go into the story. Inclinato die, uh, with the day kind of inclined, it's an ablative absolute, with the, with the day setting, literally inclining over, in other words. So in the afternoon, he was spatiabata, he was walking in Portugal in a colonnade. In other words, you know, a covered area with columns like that. Yep, that's the portico. So it's in the afternoon, so it's not dark, but it's in the afternoon, a time of relaxation. Okay, a figure of a woman, a figura mulieris, so that's a genitive, appears, present passive there, but translated as a as a simple pass in English, so it is the present because it's vivid, appears to him. And then we've got two comparatives, bigger, larger, and more beautiful, there's the and, and more beautiful, and now this, although it looks like it goes with that, it's not, that's a nominative, this is an ablative of comparison. Larger and more beautiful than a human. So in the translation of more than human size and beauty, but that's how it's working. Larger and more beautiful than a human. 
look how these are placed at the end to uh, emphasize them. You kind of, what's this figure like? We have to wait till the end to find out what it's like. And also the verb, it appeared to him. It was a sudden appearance, so the verb is up fronted in its clause. It's not at the end of the clause, it's brought to the front to make you think, boom, there appeared. But what appears? There appears to him, of a woman the figure, more that, than human, more big and more beautiful. So emphatic positioning of the words in that sentence. 